Welcome to Excel Roundup. This is Deborah Dalgleish from Contextures.com. Welcome to the Contextures newsletter for March 2016. We're going to take a look back at some of the recent Excel tips and news stories that we've featured. And the first one we'll look at is about mysterious macro warnings that you'll get. And we've got a lot more tips as well. So for those macro warnings, perhaps you're working in a file and then you try to save it. And instead of just going along nicely, Excel gives you a mysterious message saying that you can't save certain types of features in a macro free workbook. Well, as far as you know, you don't have any macros in that workbook. Maybe you recorded one, but then you deleted it or you looked at a couple of things, but you didn't really save any macros in that file. Excel likes to help you by creating a macro sheet if you record a macro and then even if you delete that macro it still keeps that code sheet and that's what you have to go through your file and delete in order for Excel to know that you really don't have any macros in that file. So I've got a very short video and some written instructions if you've run into that problem and you want to know how to smooth things out so that you can save your workbook the way you intended to. Another problem that you can run into in Excel is numbers that don't add up the way you expect them to. Sometimes you'll import data from a website or from somewhere else, you put them into Excel and instead of giving you a total of all those numbers, when you use the sum feature or the auto sum button, all you get is a zero. And what happens is that Excel doesn't recognize those numbers you brought in as real numbers. It sees them as text and the value of text is always zero. So when it adds up a lot of cells that contain what it sees as text, the total is going to be zero. So we can fix that fairly easily. I've got another little short video that shows you how to copy a blank cell and then use paste special to paste that blank cell onto all the cells that look like numbers and you tell Excel to add that zero to those numbers and that changes them to real numbers that Excel can recognize. We like to keep up with what other people are writing about Excel. And last month, Summit Bansal wrote an article that showed how to build a stopwatch in Excel. So if you're trying to keep track of the amount of time you're working on a project, or he used an example of doing a Toastmaster speech. So there are different kinds of stopwatches that he has, and you can download his file and take a look at how he set that up. Another interesting article that I found was by Ann K. Emery, and she shows how to simplify your charts and make sure that the key information is standing out. And to do that, you use a bit of text and some color to highlight the important features. Frequently, when we're working in Excel, we've got to deal with dates. I've seen a lot of data that comes in from wherever and instead of having the date in one column and the time in a different column, it comes from a system that likes to group those dates and times together. And there is a formula in Excel called INT, which is short for integer, and that INT formula is a great way to get the date or the time out of a cell that has those two values combined. So if you've got your date and time in cell A2, you could write a formula in another column that is equal INT and then open bracket A2 and close the bracket. Excel stores dates and times as numbers with a decimal place the first part of that number, the integer, is the date, and the remainder, the decimal portion, is the time. And then usually you have to format that cell as the date format that you want, whether it's a short date or something more complex. 
And to get the time, we can take that date time cell, so that could be cell A2 minus the integer portion, so minus int bracket A2 bracket, and that would give us the remainder, and that remainder, the decimal portion, is the time. And again, we would format that in the time format that we'd like. Another interesting Excel article last month was by Tom Ertes, who looked at sheet protection. If you protect a sheet and you've used a string of characters, did you know that it could be unprotected with a different string of characters? Tom looks at why that happens. So if a workbook has information that you don't want certain people to see, then the best thing is to just not let them have that workbook at all. Because once somebody has access into a workbook, it's pretty easy to break the sheet protection and see what else is in there. I also posted another tip on getting dates and times separated. So we looked at INT earlier, and an easy way if you're using Excel 2013 or later is to use the flash fill feature. So this was something new that was introduced in Excel 2013, and you can use it if you've got, for example, a list of first and last names. If you go to an adjacent column and start just typing the last name, after you've done a couple, Excel will see that pattern and try and fill down the rest of the column for you. You can do the same thing with dates. So if we've got a column of cells that have the date and time, we can start typing just the date portion. And it's a little different when we're working with dates because the flash fill doesn't fill in automatically. But once you've put in a couple and set your pattern, you can go up to the ribbon where the tools are and just click the flash fill button there and it will try to fill in the rest of the dates or the times for you. We also looked at how you can create a drop down list on a worksheet and instead of having text, how you can use symbols. And I had a, an example of using the heart symbol. I made a, an Excel Valentine card. So I made a little list where the top cell had five hearts and then the next one had four and three and two and one. And you could put a rating or a level of happiness just by selecting from a drop down list that had those little heart symbols. When you create a drop down list, Excel shows that list in a set font. You can't change the font. You can't make it show as wingdings or something fancy. So to make a heart, I pressed the Alt key and then on the number keypad, and that's not those numbers above the keyboard, Alt, and then on the number keypad, I type a three. When I let go, it puts a little heart in. Then use that as the source for a drop down list. Excel will show those symbols. Another good Excel resource that I found recently is on the Sophisticated Finance blog. And Robert Harker there, he's a professor, has collected some links to his articles on Excel and financial models. They were written a few years ago, but the information is timeless. So I'll post the link to that so you can go and check out his resources if you're interested in financial models. If your work requires you to create hyperlinks, Ben J. Koosman has, shows how to create a, a list of hyperlinks based on a file path in one cell at the top of the worksheet and then file names down a column and he shows you how to combine those so you just click on one of those links and it'll open that document for you. That's helpful if you just want to send somebody a full list of things that they can refer to. I've used it if I'm doing a presentation and I want to be able to open files quickly as I go along. Another topic that I looked at this month was sorting items in a pivot table. Whenever you create a new pivot table and you put a field in there, everything is shown in alphabetical order. So it's easy to find what you're looking for. But as you go along, you might add new items in the source data. And then when you refresh the pivot table, those items should show up. 
But what happens is that instead of staying in that alphabetical order, the new items appear at the bottom of the list. Sometimes you don't even notice them there. You've got a long list of things and you think it hasn't added your new items, but they are indeed down at the bottom. This happens because there are three sort settings in a pivot table. You can have A to Z, Z to A, or manual. And when you create a new pivot table, the default sort order is manual. So it does set things up alphabetically. It, it looks like it's A to Z, but it's manual. You can drag things to a different position, so it's easy to rearrange things quickly. But when new items are added, they just go to the bottom of the list. So if you're going to add a lot of new items and you want them to appear in the correct alphabetical order, you can right click one of the items in that field and in the pop-up menu that appears, click on the sort A to Z and that will make that an automatic sort. You can always go back to manual sort later if you need to. If you're working in Excel and you have a big worksheet with some columns for calculations and some columns that are the end results that you would want people to see, whenever you're ready to print that, you might want to hide all the columns that have those calculations. People don't need to see them. They just need to see the final pricing or whatever that worksheet is doing. If your workbook does not have any named Excel tables, you can set up a custom view. And I've got a link that shows you how to set those up. They're very helpful. You can set up as many custom views as you need, hide specific columns or apply a filter. And then when you show that custom view, it remembers all those settings you made. So it's a quick way to get a file ready for printing. And then you could have another custom view that unhides everything and shows the full worksheet again. Now, if you do have named Excel tables in your workbook on any sheet, it won't allow you to set up custom views. So what I do in that situation is just make some marks or formulas that create a code at the top of a column and then you can select all the columns that have that X and hide them. So it's not quite as nice as a custom view, but you can customize your sheet so it's easy to hide and unhide specific columns when you're ready to print something. And just a couple more articles from last month. John Peltier did an extensive article about pivot charts. So he shows you everything from the basics and how to copy a pivot chart and connect it to a different pivot table, which is a handy trick to know. Once you've set something up and you've got your pivot chart looking beautiful, you don't want to have to go through all those steps again to create the same look in a pivot table somewhere else. So it's a real time saver. And John Ekampora showed us a handy trick where you can create a search box to use with a slicer. So it's really a little hidden drop down, but it looks like a search box. And it's great if you had a slicer that has a really long list of items that will make it easier. You just type a couple of letters and it's going to show you those few items instead of making you scroll through a long list. Thank you for listening to Excel Roundup. This is Deborah Dalgleish from Contextures.com. To get the links from today's roundup, please visit www.contextures.com slash podcasts.